the dark places in life. They're, they're not enjoyable to be in. The goal is not to spend your life in them. But I think we are too quick to pull the ripcord. And I think the ideology around self-help teaches us that, you know, what, we have to get out of here. We have to help you get out of this quickly. And I think that's a mistake. And I also think the kind of singularity of those approaches are oftentimes a mistake that here's five tips, six tips, 10 techniques, you know, a seven week guide, whatever it is that can, that you can put yourself in. And I think the experience of hardship, both in, you know, the suffering that life inevitably will bring us, but also the encounter with the deep places within us, they're too personal. We've all experienced pain, fear, loss, and grief. And many of us linger on those experiences and suffer. Are those bad experiences that we should avoid at all costs? In modern society, we tend to rely on what's on the mental surface, as it were. We tend to focus on fixing things so that we are able to function, act, to work, and to play. But what if that approach uh, locks in all the pain so that it emerges in some other form later on? What if pain is merely a natural part of life and embracing pain perhaps ultimately is a good thing? This is Mind the Shift. I am Anders Bolling. My guest today is Jungian and archetypal psychologist Joanna Laprade, who has written a wonderful and very thoughtful book, Forged in Darkness, The Many Paths of Personal Transformation. Welcome to the show, Joanna. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. So you live and work in... Colorado, the U.S., right? Yes, I do. And you, you're a therapist there now, or yeah. So yeah, I have work? a I have a private practice. So, but you got your, your training in in California, I understand. Yeah, I did my master's and my doctorate at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California, which in the states is kind of one of the major um, institutes that you know focuses on depth psychology and Jungian psychology. So yeah, definitely a privilege to go to that school. Fantastic. Yeah. We spoke a little bit about Jung before, before we uh, started recording this interview here and we'll talk more about him. You, your book, uh, I mentioned the title there. It looks like this for you. For those of you who are looking on watching on, on YouTube, Forged in Darkness, <laughs> The Many Paths of Personal Transformation. I just read it and it's, it's great. And, um, I learned many things, and I got some uh, again some new perspectives there. And not not least, I learned a lot about Greek mythology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's heavy on the Greek myth. It is, yeah, and I, I love that. I, I I mean I I didn't. I mean I knew some some of it. Of course, it's it's part of the basic curriculum when you go to school, I guess, or when you're interested in these things. But but I learned a lot of that, and. Um, it is about personal transformation, and, and it is kind of a guide to, to the underworld, a, a world that we have denied at our peril, as you describe it, more or less. But you told me beforehand here, or you wrote to me beforehand, that, that it is about self-awareness, not about self-help. I mean, there are so many self-help books out there these days, but you don't really like that concept, the concept of self-help. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I, I think that the self-help model teaches us a few things. First, it teaches us this kind of mechanical attitude where here's five or six things that can kind of pull you out of what you're experiencing. And not to say that, and, and I do make this clear in my book that the dark places in life, they're, they're not enjoyable to be in. The goal is not to spend your life in them. But I think we are too quick to pull the ripcord. And I think the ideology around self-help teaches us that, 
you know, what we have to get out of here. We have to help you get out of this quickly. And I think that's a mistake. And I also think the kind of singularity of those approaches are oftentimes a mistake that here's five tips, six tips, 10 techniques, you know, a seven week guide, whatever it is that can, that you can put yourself in. And I think the experience of hardship, both in, you know, the suffering that life inevitably will bring us, but also the encounter with the deep places within us, they're too personal. They get too sterilized when we say, fit yourself into this box. When I think a, a, an approach to self-awareness is so much richer and inevitably, I think, more empowering because it's about finding your own resources. What are your ways into yourself? What are you, What's unique to you? What's alive to you? How do you manage what's happening so darkly so that you can be affected by it? Because, and that quest and that skill of attuning yourself and thus pulling upon your own resources, your own nature, the things that strengthen, the things that inspire, whatever it is for you, that self-awareness. I think when we can tune in, we get the wellspring of that part of our being to mm. guide us, to inform us. And if you don't, if you stay on the surface and you just try to kind of make the ego more hygienic, it doesn't, it's not the same resonance. No, I understand. Yeah, I think that's wise. We'll delve more deeply into that later on here uh, but to to summarize one can say that the self-help approach is is a simplification that is eventually not that helpful really yeah it doesn't attune you to yourself it mm. gives you kind of a band-aid to say okay i did these things and maybe you'll get that maybe you'll be one of the people that do find something and glean something out of those approaches that really really help but i don't think it cultivates the capacity within you to say i've got this you I've touched really something in myself bigger you, than this. You want to un understand what's really going on within you. Yeah, beautiful. Exactly. So in your book, Greek mythology is, is at the core, as we said here. And um, myself, I know quite a bit about astrology, actually, mm -hmm. and, and also tarot. Mm -hmm. And this rings so many bells when I read this mm -hmm. and, and read about these gods and, and heroes. Um, the gods and the heroes, they have counterparts in the zodiac, in the planets, and also in mm -hmm. the major arcana in tarot and as far as i understand carl gustav jung uh, was himself influenced by what he learned about astrology maybe also tarot i don't know do you, do you know about that i would say you know y jung is of the class of intellectuals that was so profoundly educated on the archetypal expression in humanity i would say there's very few rocks that he didn't look at, okay. you know, for kind of how are we expressing these symbols? How is this collectively manifesting? And why it rings so many bells for you is that it is tapping into that archetypal, you know, stratum of the mind where, you know, we see the same patterns repeat itself over and over and over again. I mean, Archie comes from the, the, the Greek or archetype comes from the Greek Archie, which means first or first form or principle. And it really is this idea that you know, there is a shared, the way that I like to imagine it is kind of like a vessel, like a pot or something that there, that the psyche seems to repeat itself in these forms throughout time, geography, culture, over and over and over again, these basic vessels, you know, mother, father, war, love, you know, son, divine child, these, these kind of ideas repeat themselves but depending on who we are, where we're born, our personal experiences, our cultural experiences, the liquid that kind of fills the vessel and thus gives form to the archetype will be unique. And we'll see different images, but at its core, it's the same essence. It's the same mm. form. That's and what so, he calls the collective unconscious, I understand. Yes, exactly. So, so Jung in the kind of analytical sphere, his, his kind of major and most unique contribution is, is positing that beneath the personal unconscious, so beneath the part of ourselves that's kind of the warehouse for the repressed or memories or aspects of ourselves that have a personal nature that we don't have immediate access to in our being, there's a collective realm that is shared in between all humanity. And the 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 engine of that part of our being is kind of the archetypal stratum so that's where he split from from freud also isn't exactly it? that that was precisely that's that's the kind of source of their breakup yeah okay 
So speaking about Jung, you are, of course, as a Jungian uh, psychologist, deeply influenced by Carl Jung, but also, I understand, by Joseph Campbell, uh, writer and uh, mythologist, perhaps mm-hmm. you might say, and, and yeah. also a Jungian, if I understand it correctly. So can you can you tell us, I mean, wh- how these two figures entered your life? Mm, like personally or in the book? Yeah, personally, I guess. That's always yeah. interesting. How did um, you run into Jung and, and Campbell? Yeah, you know, my my finding of Jung is um is is a very good Jungian story because it's very synchronistic and kind of not of me. Um, but you know, I was kind of at a time in my life where I was looking for the next the next threshold, the next thing to do, like leaving my, you know early twenties and wanting to kind of have more meaning. And I knew I wanted to study psychology. I wasn't really sure. I talk about this, I think very briefly in the book because the book does have elements of my personal life in it. And um, I had this dream where I, I was kind of on this little threshold and I, I, it became clear in the dream to me that like my purpose, it, it felt, um, Jung calls these dreams numinous. It comes from the Latin numen, which means voice of God, where you have an encounter with something in the dream space that feels really other, like not, not of you. And that feeling once, if you've had a numinous experience, it's pretty obvious. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, the dream just felt so other and it became very clear to me that my purpose was to help people cross thresholds. And I woke up and was like, what does that mean? <laughs> what is a threshold? What do you know, all these things. And I, um, I went to the library and I was just kind of searching around and randomly like on the, you know, if like books are lined up nice and straight, there was this kind of book that was a jar just like sticking out. And it was called On Young by Anthony Stevens. And um, I pulled it out. I checked it out. I read it in like two days and I I made this huge leap of faith. And it was, it was like reading, I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you, it was reading something. It was every idea I'd ever had explained to me. Like, I didn't know there were words for those things. I didn't know that there was a framework for the way that I already thought it all just felt so in alignment. It was so easy. So I made this huge leap of faith. I Googled like, where do you study Jung? <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a marvelous, um, marvelous experience to have this. Yeah, it was really, I mean, yeah. And looking back on it, I think, you know, there would never have been another path for me that combines my interest in kind of the soul and people and their stories, um, my intellectual interest in theory and big ideas. The myth piece in Jung was obviously very potent for me. I mean, as a child, like I read you know, I read myths, I read fairy tales, I have, it's been really baked into me from a really young age. And I mean, I think I was probably like 15 the first time I read like the hero with a thousand faces. I mean, just so into that way of thinking. Um, And that's that's the most famous book by Joseph Campbell, I I take it. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of his, um, I would say that's kind of the culmination of his opus and what he's best known for is this, it, this beautiful distillation of hero mythology into the 16 step hero's journey that, you know, I think out of a mythic image, I don't think anything in the Western imagination has fascinated us like the hero. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's such a, and, and I think for human experience, I mean, I'm kind of diverting from my personal story, but I think, you know, that the hero is that part of us that is able to recognize when the old life is worn out and thin and needs tending and and the incredible courage and bravery and stretching that it takes to leave the comfort of the old in us, in our lives, set Mm -hmm. out into some kind of journey in ourselves, in our world, where we cross a threshold, where we become more than who we used to be. And that's the story of human transformation. It's the story of becoming more than you thought ever possible. And I think that's why it's just such an enticing mythogen for us. We're so interested in that human journey of really expansion into being. And Joseph Campbell has done so much for us to kind of bring it to life and um, and make it, you know, this, 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 this expression of human, really, I think, personhood that we see repeated over and over and over and over. 
Yeah, and and the hero myths are so central in in your book. And mm -hmm. as you say, we have in our Western society such a narrow view mm -hmm. of what a hero is. So it's very very uh, enlightening to 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 learn about all the different paths that can be a mm -hmm. heroic path actually to yeah, understand yourself. That, and that's like the real meat and an effort of the book is mm -hmm. that we've taken this incredible archetype and capacity to kind of be affected by and be stronger and withhold more than we thought possible. And we've reduced it to one expression of heroism that says, be strong, fix it, use your sword, willpower alone, get better. And we're narrowing this, this, this archetypal energy that has so much color, so much capacity in it to the singular expression that in, in some moments in life, that aspect of our being, you know, I associate it because the book is so heavy, like you said, on Greek myth, I associate these qualities with Hercules, the great Greek hero who, you know, sword in hand, but fights all the monsters, you know, is always the conquering victor. Caveat, you know, Hercules fights monsters his whole life and nothing ever happens to him except that. And I don't think very many of us want that in our life. Okay, and I want to talk about the the, the hero Hercules and all the yeah, others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sorry. That, yeah, but before, no, I, I, I mean we don't have to follow my my list of questions here. But I just I just wanted to before that we're going to dive into the darkness now. I was thinking. Yes. So Go ahead. before we talk all about right. the specific gods and heroes here, um, on the back of the cover, uh, on the back cover of of the book, it says uh, empower yourself through your struggles and suffering. So I've, I've been pondering this a bit, quite a bit, because it's also at the core of what I, my kind of life view and, and worldview on things or view on the, on the soul and, and uh, life and, and everything. How important is it to dive into, into these dark depths and ling linger there? I mean, mm -hmm. until all is found, because I can, I can just say one more thing before you answer that, because uh, about halfway into the book, I think, um, uh, there is a grief ex grief expert who says something that I had myself been pondering uh, mm. on uh, while reading the book, and he says something along the line. It's not exactly these words, but along the lines of, "Suffering is or pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional." Mm. Would you agree with that? So, and and those words are David Kessler's. I I I would actually, in my own way, say yes. I think suffering is a state of mind. I. I would say two things to that. Like we can, we can understand suffering maybe in two different ways. I think what David Kessler means in that quote is that pain, the, ex, you know, the experience of hardship in life of let's use his example and his framework, like losing somebody that you love, that's going to happen in life. I mean, if you make it through an entire life without ever being affected by that, it will be quite an unusual life. And this, I think what suffering is, I think we think of suffering as the kind of stewing of like the, 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 the deep pain in something. And I think that can be a choice. I would argue it's a good choice in some ways. I think the soul loves to suffer. You know, James Hellman, who is a Jungian who founded archetypal psychology, he's really keen on this idea of you know, that the, the soul deepens into suffering. We It wants to fall apart. It wants to kind of darken, thicken, be in pain. And I think if we can allow ourselves to confront those hard places, which is enormously hard. I mean, here we are right in these beautiful rooms talking about this incredible suffering, and it's a very deep and profound experience. But, but it's also very individual. I mean, personal, what you what you think of as pain and suffering. I mean, it can differ. Yeah enormously between different individuals. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think suffering is is a is a is a is a more thick experience. It's a heavier experience. And and I think, you know, as a therapist in my personal life, in the practice that I have, I have met I mean, maybe I'm wrong and I'd love to be corrected. I'd be fascinated to be corrected, but <clears throat> I have yet to meet anyone who talks about becoming more than they thought that they were, some part of themselves that they didn't know existed, a strength that they learned, a, an inspiration that they had, a passion that was seeded, any of those massive things that are so meaningful and enriching in life 
coming from the daylight, coming from places that are not of suffering. And I think we we get so afraid of those places and it they compromise our our preference for order and control and 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 being contained in ourselves so much that we pull ourselves out so quickly and we don't let ourselves suffer. You know, suffer comes from the Latin suffero which means to be with. It's like to be in what's happening to us so that it can transform us so that it can ferment us and I think, you know, we we think of it as a bad thing. And so we sterilize it <clears throat> with our mm-hmm. pills, with our quick fixes, with the attitude that we have. You're on you're onto something interesting here, namely the de- definition of suffering, because it as we normally define it, it is something terrible, terribly bad and, and painful and everything. But maybe suffering is just to, as you say, go deep down there and 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 just look at things look at what you have there and it doesn't have to be dangerous at all it's just i mean enjoyable is maybe not the right word but it can be after a while when you get used to it it's more like you're you're analyzing and you're dissecting and digesting and doing things with it to learn what is there well you know and i think it's such an essential quality or attitude because it's inevitable you know, when something terrible happens to you in your life that wants to pull you into those places, you oftentimes don't get a choice over it. Mm. No one would choose to go into that intentionally, you know, and well, I shouldn't say no one, but I can't imagine many. And, you know, it's, 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 it's here. And so you, you don't get the magic wand. You don't get the remote control that can say, turn this off. So what do you have to do to be with it? Because that's the choice that you have. Okay, so yeah, um, great. Let's let's uh, go into these Greek gods and heroes now. You have this mythology that represent archetypal motives, of course, and and in your book, and you employ them as kind of guide for us to find the way inward and downward, if that's how you should put it. Uh, so let's go through the ones that you focus on here, and um, can you please tell us? I mean, how the archetypes they represent can help us when we descend into our underworld uh, to yeah. heal and eventually be. So there are four, I think, four heroes and three gods. Am I right? Yeah. So let's start with, you already began talking a little bit about Hercules. Let's talk mm-hmm. a little bit more about what does Hercules represent here? Well, I think, you know, to, to back up just a tiny bit, I mean, the whole idea of kind of this mythic unpacking is that because we have become so singular in our relationship to how we navigate the underworld, we're we're losing all of these different amazing ways in that also show us through the mythic figures, what happened to them. Everyone that I talk about in the book is narrowed into specifically having gone into the underworld and come back up. And so there's you know, there's mythic figures that go in and don't come back up. There's ones that never do, but it's that descent and ascent. And that's kind of the, the, the qualification for the study. And each of these journeys, they represent behaviors, attitudes, suites of characteristics that we can kind of notice in ourselves. That really is an attempt to show people that there's more than just Hercules. You know, there's more than, you know, that Hercules goes into the underworld to kind of fulfill the final task of this 12 kind of step redemption that he's assigned Uh, by Zeus. 12 labors, exactly. And it's to, it's his task is to remove Severus from the underworld and take him back up and, and then return him. And that's the kind of hero that we hear a lot about in, in the West, right? It is. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, and he's so Hercules goes into the underworld with his sword and his, well, he has a club, but you know, his big, his big muscles and he beats everything. He tries to choke one of the shades. He, he wrestles with one of them. He, you know, he frees Theseus. He, he tampers with that space as if he knows exactly what to do as his willpower alone. And then he, you know, and, and this, I think, is a, a really valuable kind of mythic quality. Persephone, the queen of the underworld, tells Hercules that she can take Severus back with him if he does so without any weapon. He has to rely on his own incredible fortitude. And so Hercules chokes this three-headed dog who's the threshold guardian and drags him up. And it's this wonderful image of 
that type of colossal willpower, colossal strength. I mean, imagine choking your suffering into submission. I mean, it's such a powerful image of that part of our being. And there's other things that ha- happens to Hercules and I won't, you know, go so far. People don't want to buy my book, but no, um, people, people can read it in, in your book or in other books, in many books, exa- I guess. Exactly. But, you know, this is one way of handling that type of experience, the deep, the dark, the heavy. And, you know, the, the other heroes that I really spend time on Orpheus, Odysseus, and Aeneas, they show us really, really different ways. I mean, my personal favorite hero or the one that I think I connect with the most is Aeneas. Okay. Um, Let's talk about Aeneas. Aeneas is the, um, he's the, He's the highest ranking Trojan to to survive the fall of Troy. And after the fall of Troy, he's tasked with kind of finding a new home for his people, for the surviving Trojans. And kind of in myth and history, Aeneas is considered to be the father of Rome as the father of Romulus and Remus. And so Aeneas sets out to, you know, rebuild a civilization for his people. And along the way, you know, he kind of runs into his, you know, thick spot where he doesn't know what to do. And he prays to his mother, Aphrodite, and she says, you have to go into the underworld. And so Aeneas, he's, he's just such a magnificent contrast to Hercules. So Aeneas immediately says like, I can't do this on my own. I don't know the way that's too big of a thing. How like, you know, and prays for help. His mother supports him by recommending that he goes to this Apollonian um, temple there he encounters a guide called the Sibyl he the Sibyl agrees to come into the underworld with him so right away Aeneas automatically approaches the hardship from the point of needing guidance saying this is too big for me on my own I, I can't hold this on my own I don't know the way on my own mm-hmm. and so instead of Hercules right who just bowls into it he he recognizes that what he's encountering might be beyond him And as Aeneas goes into the underworld, he never, he doesn't really speak. You can, this, this is described in Aeneid, in Virgil's Aeneid, but he, he doesn't really speak. He, he wanders into the darkness. He listens. Sybil kind of tells him all about this, this shade, this shade. He sees the people suffering. He cries. He reaches out to them. He just has this incredible kind of, he just absorbs it all. And he gets to, um, he, his goal is to speak to his father and Chistis. And so he gets to his father and there he just listens to his dad the entire time mm-hmm. and never draws his sword, never asks any directive questions. And his father tells him more about the underworld than any other hero, any other really mythic figure. He learns all about the cosmology, the order, the reason behind it. He's told his future, what he needs to do to found Rome all of this incredible stuff. And it all comes from this place of just being completely present and completely listening to what's Mm. happening. It's a completely different energy. I mean, imagine facing your hardship and knowing, okay, like I'm working with something bigger than me. I have to have reverence for it because it's large. It's like my pain, my suffering, my encounter with the parts of myself that I'm afraid of, like they're bigger than I am. And how can I listen to them? What are they trying to communicate to me? How can I be in relationship with them in a gentle and kind of present way? And the message that I think that story tells us in some ways is, you know, you can learn more. Hercules doesn't learn anything in his entire life. It's so So different. And yes, it's a, it's the humble heroism. Yeah, exactly. So and, and what's so important is it still still teaches us that that's her- that's heroic. It is. He's still a great hero. That type of listening, that type of reverence, it takes the same amount of heroism as raising a sword. Yeah, sometimes it's more brave to 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 listen to people and not say anything yourself. Yeah. Than, than to just talk, <laughs> um, for instance. Then you then you have Orpheus and uh, Odysseus. Mm-hmm. Orpheus um, <clears throat> is a wonderful hero. I would say in some ways, kind of a hero that in a lot teaches us what not to do. Um, Orpheus goes into the underworld to kind of correct the moves of fate that his bride, his bride Eurydice dies on his wedding night. And he's so distraught by her death that he goes into the underworld to beg for her to return. And Orpheus is the great kind of poet and and he plays the lyre. He's the great kind of singer of the Greek world. And 
he goes into the underworld with his lyre and he sings the song of his grief and he just melts everybody's hearts. And he, you know, he shows us this way of kind of handling hardship that's very creative, that's very vulnerable, that's very open. And he goes to Persephone and he begs and he speaks of his great love. And he says, you know, take me, not her, anything you want, you know, this, and, and Persephone agrees to let him return with his wife if under the condition that he can go back to the day world without looking back at her. And so Orpheus successful in his plea, in his prayer, in his plea, you know, comes back up and right before the surface, he can't trust himself and he turns back and Eurydice who's following him has to kind of slip back into the underworld. And this myth has, I mean, there's so much to unpack in that. I think what stands out for me is this kind of creative element, this imaginative element, the vulnerable element, the kind of petitionary prayer element, the pleading element of th these things that I think a lot of us do rely on when we're suffering. But also where I say in the beginning, Orpheus is a hero that kind of teaches us what not to do. Orpheus, he does not trust himself. There is, he cannot rely, you know, that Persephone says to him, you know, trust your music, she'll follow you. And his, his music is his innate skill. It's his, the essence of his being. And he can't trust that he's enough and he can't um, rely on that. And so that kind of failure of really being able to hold what we believe in, in ourselves is a really important reminder. And I also think Orpheus you know, it is very difficult to let someone's life be their own, especially when they're suffering. And there's this kind of idea in that mythology of, you know, did Orpheus, did he deserve to go down and save his bride? Was that her fate? How do you let someone else's pain be their own? And, you know, Orpheus makes a great mistake in trying to pull his wife out of the underworld and not rely on himself and kind of disrupt the order of fate. And he responds to it in this way where he retreats entirely from the world of men and women, but he pulls back, he goes into the forest, he, he removes himself from life. And I think there's a really important reminder in that, that there are, you know, there are griefs, there are pain, there are things in life that if we go too far, we can pull ourselves completely out of life and no longer be, you know, in the land of living halfway in, in the, in the underworld forever. And, you know, there, like I said, there's so much in that mythology and I unpack a lot of different themes in that chapter, but, you know, Orpheus is like, you can already see like, this is such a different way of handling hardship yeah. than what we're told. I mean, do yeah. we ever even ask ourselves, should I let this person just suffer and be with what what's happened to them to let their fate be their own? I think we're taught, I mean, most people I know can't really sit with that. They try to fix, they try to repair, they try to make you feel better. You know, it's, I think in some ways that's oftentimes the gift of therapy is having somebody that says, that doesn't try to fix you. Mm. Just listens and lets Listen. you, lets you suffer. Yeah. And then you have Odysseus, that's the last hero. Yeah. And so Odysseus, who's the great hero of Homer's Odyssey, um, he goes into the underworld um, to kind of learn how he can, he learned, he goes to speak to the Thebian seer, Tircius, and to learn about how he can finally make it home. The Odyssey is about his kind of long epic to try to get back to his home after the fall of Troy. Yeah. yeah. And um, Odysseus is a, is a, you know, he's the great kind of wordsmith. He's a wily thinker. He's very hermetic in that sense. Um, you know, he, he's very clever and, um, you know, the, my favorite part in that in Odysseus's mythology actually starts in the beginning of his trip to the underworld. I think it's a really human moment where he's told by Circe, the goddess that he's living with at the time, that he needs to go into the underworld. And Odysseus does this wonderful thing in the Odyssey where he's told this, the Odyssey's written in first person. And he just like, he's on this bed and he just wails and wails and wails. And he throws this like tantrum for like two pages about like, oh, woe is me, you know, and they pull their hair and beat their breasts, all <laughs> that language, you know. And, and he just talks about, he doesn't want to go. And he's like, Rrr. and then he has this wonderful moment where he's like, and then I got off the bed. And it's such a wonderful human moment. I think to our experiences of suffering, it's like some, sometimes just got to wallow on the bed for a little while and be yeah. like, oh, 
I can't believe this is happening. I don't want this. This is terrible. You know, pull your hair, all the things. Mm -hmm. And then life happens, right? You have to get off the bed. You have to get out of that. Yeah. Eventually you get off the bed. You can just, you can, yeah, you can wallow for a couple of days. You can wallow for a little bit, you know, and I think sometimes people need that. It's like, yeah, just, this is garbage. Of course you don't want this to be happening in your life. And then you have to face it. Right. And, And I love that part in his myth. And I think it's such an important just image for, kind of the honest human experience. And then, so Odysseus goes down to, he kind of goes into a threshold moment with the underworld. He doesn't go fully, but he, he, um, <clears throat> he digs a pit, he sacrifices and, you know, the, the, the shades are always drawn to blood. So the shades come out of the darkness and he's waiting for um, Tiresias to arrive. And unlike Aeneas, Odysseus is enormously directive. He asks a ton of questions he has different shades that come to his pit and he asks them, what are you doing? How are you get here? What are, you know, all these different, like he's very engaged. And um, when Tiresias comes, he asks him a bunch of questions. Um, he, he does something that Orpheus can't. He has, at the time, he doesn't know that his mother had passed away. And when his, the shade of his mother comes to the pit, um, it's very sad for him and very overwhelming for him and he's tempted to kind of like reach out to her but he knows that she's no longer his and of this world and so he lets her go and and i think that moment is is very important because it reminds us you know that that sometimes things are out of our whole, out of our control and we have to let you know things slip away and our loved ones slip away and the old life slip away and various aspects. But I think kind of distilled into a really simple way, you know, Odysseus is a hero of enormous engagement. He uses his mind, he asks questions, and he learns a lot through that kind of active communication, that style of what's happening to me, what's happening to you. Have you ever been in a situation like this? He's engaged in a way that no other hero is. And Mm -hmm. unlike Hercules, right, who just kind of jabs his club at things, Mm -hmm. He, he asks the shades, the questions, what's happened to you? Why are you here? What was this like for you? And, and he learns an enormous amount because of that. Odysseus comes across as kind of a, a mental Hercules in a way. Yeah. I think astrologically you would say that he's a, or in the tarot, you would say that he's a swords person and that Hercules is a, <laughs> is a, 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 a wands person or a fire in astrology. And then Odysseus is more like air. <laughs> Sure. So uh, that's interesting. I think Odysseus has a lot of hermetic qualities, right? He's very much like Hermes in a lot of ways. Yeah. And that's very air, like air, very air. Hermes is the representative of Mercury, the planet Mercury, which is also a symbol of Gemini, which is a, an air sign. So anyway, let's go into those, uh, the, the, the gods there. You mentioned hermetic, how to be hermetic. And Hermes is one of the gods that you you zoom in on, zero in on here. Hermes, Persephone, and Dionysus. Mm-hmm. So, her, and what, what's the difference between the the four heroes and the three, the three gods? What what are the different um, uh, points uh, of uh, describing them? Are the first ones like styles of heroism that you can adopt when you when you go into your depths, and and the gods are more like, uh, or, or j- explain what's how do you differ between yeah, those two I, groups? I would differ between them kind of just in the humanity of them in some ways. I mean, like I was saying earlier, you know, the hero's journey, it is this kind of portrait of the, the, the kind of archetypal energies of human change and the heroes, you know, toil, they suffer, they grind, they make mistakes, they grow. They, they have this kind of human engagement of change and, and kind of, and I think in that they represent our own struggles of that journey in and out. The gods, unlike the heroes, the gods come preformed. They pop into existence. You know, they they just are. The archetypes, an archetypal expression, you know, it's not morally attuned. It's not right or wrong. It just is. In these most most deities in the Greek world are enormously contradictory right? They have these like really clashy elements. They typically have behavior that we would kind of from society's perspective be like, Ooh, (laughs) you know, but you know, they just are. And I think because of that, they show us just qualities of being. And I think the heroes show us kind of ways of imagining and engaging in, in our change. And I think you can overlay like, because there are a lot of heroic qualities that have aspects of these deities, almost like 
the heroes pull on the archetype, more pure archetypal energy of the gods, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's more archetypal, more concrete. And, um, you know, I, these, these three, most of the Olympian gods don't dabble in the underworld. Um, you know, Apollo, the kind of or- god of order and light and reason and rationality, never goes into the underworld. They're and on like, Olympus all, all the time. Then. Yeah, they don't dabble in those dark places. And these three are the exception. I mean, Hermes, Hermes is psychopomp, so meaning guide of souls. So his main duty is to guide all those that die into the, into the underworld. And most figures that go into the underworld are guided by Hermes in some capacity, including Dionysus, including Persephone. He's kind of the denizen of that threshold. But he's a messenger between the the, the the day world and the underworld, isn't he, Hermes? Yeah. I mean, Hermes is, he is the god of message, communication. He's a life spirit, the god of the in-betweens, of threshold. Hermetic people move quickly. Nothing sticks to them. They, you know, they go in between easily. Um, you know, Hermes is the great trickster he's kind of the light breeze in and out of the window he's he embodies a state of being that is very um in flux hard to get a hold of you know mercury that kind of element of of quicksilver that changes that is volatile um that that quality is is a really different kind of thing to galvanize in yourself when you're suffering than say any of the heroes or the other deities that kind of this, this could be quick. I could move, I could communicate, you know, I could tell story. I could, you know, also I think Hermes represents a, someone who in some ways has a lot of comfort in these places that goes in and out. You know, the, the guide of souls is a, is a part of both worlds. And then you have Persephone, who is uh, the one who was forced to stay in the underworld because, uh, just, uh, remind me. <laughs> So story. Persephone, very, very quickly, Persephone is abducted. Per- Perfes- Persephone uh, yeah, she's abducted. Is, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Her, her, so prior to the abduction, her name is Kore, which means bud-like or innocence. And Kore is a nymph who's playing in the fields when Hades sees her, falls in love with her, and kind of abducts her and takes her into the underworld. And of course, per- Persephone is very distraught. Her mother, Demeter, who's the goddess of kind of fertility and crop is even more distraught and Demeter goes around begging and looking and seeking. And finally she finds out from Zeus that Persephone is in the underworld. She begs to have him return her in her grief. You know, it's kind of a season myth as well in her grief, you know, the crops die, fall comes, winter comes. And Zeus agrees to have her return, save for that Persephone has eaten some pomegranate seeds in the underworld, and you can't eat in the underworld and then not be bound there for some reason. And so Persephone is kind of in her. So so when this happens, she goes from Kore to Persephone, which which means kind of beautiful darkness, and becomes the queen of the underworld and spends half of her season in the underworld with her husband Hades and half of the season with her mother and, you know, spring, fall, you can see that kind of rotation. And I think the, the, the piece about Persephone that really stands out for me is, you know, Persephone does this enormous thing with her fate that, you know, life sometimes rips you into Hades. It pulls you unexpectedly into dark places. And Persephone in her mythology is described as, you know, sad and all the things until her fate is kind of decreed. And Zeus says, you know, no, you have to be the queen of the underworld. And she does this incredible thing with her fate and like completely embraces it and adopts the name Persephone. She's never in all of her mythology after that, Persephone is described as kind of the great and powerful queen of the underworld. She's she's the force of darkness that prayers are made to. She's the one that people seek out for help. She really owns this enormous transformation from this kind of innocent maiden to this great and powerful being. And I think in a lot of ways, it shows us, you know, in some way, I think we could imagine like, did Persephone need to be abducted? She became something so much more powerful in herself, Mm. in her personhood, in her effect in the universe. She matured. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Exactly. She matured. 
And, and I think also Persephone, you know, her cyclicality, she goes in and out of the underworld is a really important reminder for us because we too will probably go in and out of darkness. You know, we come back up, maybe grief is very cyclical, right? Sometimes it feels like you've, you've, you've dealt with what needed to be dealt with. Maybe you've made meaning, maybe it's okay. And then, you know, the next morning it's not. And you're you're back in that that place, and to to understand that that cyclicality is okay, that it's natural, it's a part of the rhythm of these dark places, and we can still be embodied in our power and who we are, and maybe that incredible strength comes from kind of that rotation and the relationship with both worlds. That you know, I think a lot of times our suffering requires of us. Yeah, and then Dionysus represents something that. Uh, Qualities that we wouldn't perhaps uh, connect with heroism in, in in the Western world, because I mean, yeah. you think of him as somebody who who uh, indulges in you know binge drinking and and right. ecstasy and things like that. But he's also connected, as you describe it in the book, with with nature and and with the body and all those things that we tend to forget here in this in this modern society. So tell us a little bit more yeah. about Dionysus. I mean, I think. Dionysus is by far the most repressed god in our culture, the most repressed energy. I think we are taught very, very young not to be Dionysian. Mm. You know, Dionysus is god of revelry, of ecstasy, of release. His main epithet was lysos, which means loosener. He's, He's the force in us that pulls things apart. He's related to nature, but kind of not the cultivated pretty gardens, but the kind of vine that grows without water, the the force of kind of raw instinct, raw nature. Everything about Dionysus is overwhelming. It's unrefined. It's bestial. You know, the, the Dionysian energy is so in the body. You know, I think to be in a Dionysian journey, to, to see that archetype in you is to scream, is to roar, to fall apart, to have your heart beat fast. I mean, a panic attack is a really Dionysian moment. Mm-hmm. And I think in our culture, we're, we're so, we're so afraid of that energy. And, you know, I think we're taught, you know, even you can think about even as a kid, right? Like sit still and sign your name on a piece of paper. It's like, the, you know, the moment we start filtering that instinctual, unrefined part of ourselves, we lose access to its cathartic energy. And, you know, Dionysus is, is the great God of loosening and release and there is something I think very essential for us to remember in the Dionysian journey that, you know, a, a part of our beating, our being wants to roar. It wants to fall apart. It wants to scream. It wants to scratch at things. And if you can handle that energy, if you can stay with that energy, it is normally, you know, diffusing. It's that pressure. It's, it's like, you know, when we think we can repress stuff, right? We pour our little layers of cement to keep things in control. Dionysus is the energy that underneath that starts cracking the cement, starts boiling out. You know, what we repress always persists. And it's that kind of ceaseless life energy. And I think, you know, a lot can be said in our beings by just letting that rawness out. And I think there is a degree of control that does have to come with that just so that we can kind of keep our head on our shoulders. But I'm sure many, you know, listeners and people can kind of think of moments where, you know, they had to let that part out because not everything can be kept in, in a clean way. And I mean, it's no no wonder people go to sports uh, arenas and shout out their, you know, shout all kinds of things and they go to discotheques and dance and they go to rave parties. And I mean, in, in traditional, some in, in some native cultures and also in ancient times, we had the shamans who had this, I guess, this Dionysian, Dionysian role and helped people uh, get that out of their system in a way. Yeah. And today we have to go to rave parties. Yeah, we well, we have, you know, it's like in, in the US, I think, you know, it's like we have, well, which I is changing a little bit, but it's like we have events like Burning Man, right? Where yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the the lawyers that have, you know, the lawyers and the mathematicians and, you know, all the normal people come and for a week, it's this like revelry and release. And, you know, and I think one of the things that Dionysus is really interesting about in his mythology is that <clears throat> in his celebration and his um, particular kind of invocation He's, it's never done in isolation. And that's really stressed in his kind of ritual and his um, religious following, his cults, that this is not 
you know, the, the, the true Dionysian experience is about community. It's about kind of the shared expression of release and revelry and letting go and connection. And I think we get into trouble with Dionysus when we are Dionysian in our basement by ourselves. Mm. You know, when, when you're trying to access that big energy in isolation and, you know, that's addiction. Those are these these other issues that I think kind of come from the shadow side of that. But I think his mythology kind of offers us a really interesting, like go, go to your like football stadium and scream, you know, go to your rave, release your hair, like be alive in a different way. That's okay. We need to restore Dionysus. That's for sure. I, I think very much so. I think we would have a little bit more fun in our culture and we might value nature more. So. <laughs> yeah. That's also a thing. So Joanna, you, Tell many stories in your book here about uh, people, I mean, your own younger brother, for one, and also some of your clients and some other people who are who suffer severe uh, physical ailments, often cancer. There are several examples of that in the book, people who have cancer. And so how do you see the connection between psyche and soma, between the psyche and, and the body, so to speak? I would say, you know, there is no separation between psyche and body. I think we, you know, the Western mind comes from a philosophical tradition of division. You know, we are Cartesian in our thought. Mm. We we think it's his know, fault. It's it is his fault. <laughs> no, I mean that that mind and matter are separate. And we've we've divided our world into these really clean polarities, and the body and the mind fit into that in our in our framework. And I, you know, I think a lot of contemporary research, even in the mainstream, is changing that as we you know learn more about metaphysics, as we learn more about the brain and how you know the body does kind of always store how the body holds ancestral memories, you know, traumas that get passed generationally. I mean, all this really rich research. But I think, you know, we make a really big mistake when we separate soma, somatics, the body and, and psyche. And especially when we do that on the unconscious, because I think the unconscious is, it's all of it, right? It's, yeah. it's both our, our, our somatic body and our mind. And, you know, I think particularly in the kind of healing say of trauma and, and, and more acute suffering, you know, if you do all the like beautiful mental moves that you do and you do not tend the somatic part of the body, our research is showing over and over and over again, nothing happens, right? The mm -hmm. body holds on to these things. It holds on to our pain. It holds on to the memory of stuff. And I think a lot of times the healing of suffering really is about turning into the body. Yeah, I totally really agree. But I mean, it, it becomes a little, some somewhat something of a of a hen and egg problem here. What's the hen and what's the egg? Because or the chicken and the egg? I don't know what you say in English. The hen and the egg. <laughs> I think it's chicken, but hens are chicken. So <laughs> hens and chicken. Okay, we say anyway. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I mean, you can say that you a person suffers because they have a physical ailment, but it mm -hmm. could all, just as well be the other way around. I mean, they have this ailment because they were suffering, because they were lingering on some problems mm -hmm. they imagined that they had. And so mm -hmm. they they almost attracted the cancer, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you see, do you follow my, catch my drift here? 100%. I mean, I yeah. think it's a really edgy conversation to kind of start thinking about the kind of and I think in a lot of ways, Jung is a, is a useful framework for this conversation because, you know, the, the Jungian idea that the emphasis of the Jungian project is individuation and the idea being kind of, of becoming our full, our total personhood. And, you know, Jung argues that, you know, we have a self, uh, a center of being that kind of directs in a teleological way our personhood and the drive towards wholeness. And that part of ourselves is not moral. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not going to look at life and say, oh, you know, does she really want to get sick? I mean, she's a really sweet person. And, you know, is it, is, is, and does I really know it's, it. it's tricky to talk about it, but yeah, it's really tricky to talk about it. And, and I, and I, and I think, you know, that, that part of our being, and I, and I, I feel this from my personal experience working with, you know, I would say specifically cancer patients where 
you know, it's most of them will say like cancer was the greatest teacher of my life. Yeah. And this has changed my life and woke me up to who I needed to be. And it's amazing to see what revisions in life people will make when they realize, you know, is my cancer, you know, what is trying to die in me? Because my body's enacting that. And is it my marriage? Is it my relationship to my worth? Is it the lifetime of giving too much of myself to other people? And, and I think, you know, it's having been the, the, the container for a lot of people that work on this process, it's pretty profound to see people say, you know, like I needed this and it woke me up to myself. And I think from that Jungian perspective, it's, you can argue theoretically that it's the self saying enough, you know, like I'm going to put this pain, this roadblock in your life. And you have, because of that, have an opportunity to relate to your life in a different way and connect to some part of yourself that you haven't been wanting to connect to. Fascinating. I, I was actually going to ask about exactly what you're talking about now, namely that what, what in the tarot is known as a tower moment. I mean, you have the tower card, which is uh, represents um, sudden sudden change or an up, upending of, of your mm-hmm. life situation because of a failure to notice signals that tell you that you need to course correct. And when you don't do that, you get this kick in the butt, if you see what I mean. So yeah. that's... Kind of a tower moment that what that you're just what you're describing here. Absolutely, you know, and I and I I think it's an edgy conversation because we were you know kind of go back to that division. We we morally divide everything in our culture, so people see, say hear comments like that and they think, "Were you like saying that the person was bad and that they needed to get cancer?" And it's like that's not what's ha- that there's that morality doesn't exist when it when we speak of psyche. It's not the way the psyche functions. It doesn't look and say, oh, you know, this tower moment needed to happen because they're bad. It's just like life force needs to move in a different way. This will move the pendulum. Mm-hmm. And I think the more we ignore it, the harder the push is. Beautiful. Uh you also say many wise things about the Western society, uh, apart from what we've already been mentioning here, and how we have distanced, distanced, distanced our, ourselves from deep feelings and almost unlearned how to how to dive into the uh, how to d- deal with death and darkness. But and I think this you mentioned Cart- Cartesius, Descartes. Uh, it began around that time, the 1600s, 1700s, when when you know, um, natural science took over the role of the re- of, of religion to be mm-hmm. our life, to give us life guidance. But but I'm not sure I agree with the way you describe how we are obsessed with positivity. Mm-hmm. Of course, I mean, in the self-help world, as we were t- mentioning earlier here, it, it, it is a bit like that. I agree. It can come across as a bit naive, uh, a naivety in the, in the way that... Um, it's described as if, I mean, if you only have positive thoughts, everything's going to work out for you. Everything's going to be great. But on the other hand, there is a barrage of uh, negative and fear-laden messages from the media, from politicians, from organizations, 24-7. Isn't there? What 100%. 100%. I think how I would answer that is... I, I think that our world 100% is pushing out that fear that, but, but I think part of why we see, how do I want to say this? It's like part of why we see as much projection and blame and scapegoating and all of this like issues of tension that we have in our culture is because we see those fear things and we think, no, that's not me. There's so little owning of that coming in being like, well, that's interesting. Like, where is that my shadow? Or where do I, like, why I I hate this person? What do I hate in myself? Because we want this image. I think, I think for me, I feel like that image of positivity is really focused on kind of the social media world and our projection of our persona of being like good and happy and pretty and in this doctored image world that we want to share what about our life is so wonderful. And I think the image around ourselves is starting to coalesce as you have to be this great thing or this, you know, this positive, like we ask ourselves, how do you, are you happy in life? I think that question is so fascinating. I Mm. mean, 
the, the, the idea of happiness as the priority of life is so new to the human experience. I mean, definitely born by kind of the rise of secularism, but the idea for most cultures, I mean, let's say like just keeping it in kind of the Abrahamic religions is that life is about suffering and it's super hard and messy and terrible. And you try to do these things to live a good way. And then after you die, you'll get to be, you'll get the positive life, like the happy life. And the idea that you have to be happy and positive all the time, it's really new. And I think it makes that onslaught of enormous reality about our world, our suffering, the violence, the issues that we're having. It's like this shield around it. We're like, well, not me. It's them that's doing that. If only those people didn't think that way, then no. I, and it wouldn't be because I think it's very hard for us to absorb that. You know, you're right. Like, wow, I do think that way. And where, where, where would I like to admit that that's a part of my shadow? We don't have that practice. Mm. Maybe the, the, the news, uh, the negative barrage, the barrage of negative messages is our collective shadow in a way. Yeah, I think it's it is. There. <laughs> so, but, uh, This, uh, you talk about happiness and it's, it's a little bit like when you talked about earlier here about um, suffering, it's, it's an issue of how, how to define it, how, how we define suffering and how we define happiness. I mean, happiness might be defined as not the way we are used to looking at it, but some kind of equanimity maybe, mm -hmm. uh, because I mean, if we now dive a little bit into spirituality if you, if you have if you have time i don't know if you, maybe you're in a hurry no 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 i have time you have time good because i have a couple of more questions and these are a bit <laughs> deep so yeah, we yeah. might have to to ponder them a little bit so there are uh, uh as you know um a growing number of people who, are, who point to what they call you know awakening or realization or similar concepts often a reference to Zen or other forms of Buddhism. And um, some emphasize what they call non-duality. You know, that there is really no separation between, not, not only not between people, but not between people and animals, people and nature, people and anything. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, we're all one. And it's, but it's always about deep, deep self-inquiry. And what mm -hmm. they point to is the possibility of an end to suffering in this lifetime and reaching a point of, what you might call equanimity, perhaps. Um, and it's also a liberation from the shackles of time, because without mm -hmm. time, I mean, time is necessary for suffering to occur, because you can't suffer without a sense of time, really. It's, mm -hmm. when you think about it, it's, it, it is like that, actually. So, yeah, so when you truly live in the now, which is, I mean, as these people say, these teachers or pointers, or whatever, whatever you want to call them, when you live in, in, in the, the now moment, which is, what is actually the real reality, you have a heightened experience, heightened sense of, of life, and you see that memories and beliefs and ideas and thoughts are not real. They're all thoughts and thoughts are not real. So what do you make of all this? Is, is, it, is this not really possible? Are they, in a way, circumventing darkness when they mm -hmm. talk about these things? Mm -hmm. Such a big question. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big question, you know, and and I definitely be humble admit to I don't know the answer in any way, shape, or form. But you know, I'm trying to think what comes to mind for me. Um, I I think you know I don't know if you're familiar with um, is it who is it I think it's Epictetus the Greek philosopher who comes up with a more fancy but it's kind of been more adopted as an existential term. Um, a more fancy kind of means like love of fate, mm -hmm. and when In, in, in the existential kind of framework, you know, Nietzsche is a big fan, although actually potentially a good, good character for us to un unpack in that framework because thought a lot about these ideas and obviously suffered Nietzsche? enormously. Nietzsche? You're talking about Nietzsche? Yeah. yeah, he's a bit misunderstood, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> a very, a very complex person. Um, mm. But, you know, he talks about this idea of more fati as kind of being like the active choice in being able to love one's fate, to be with one's fate. And for some reason that comes to mind for me in your question, because it's, it's like, I, I personally don't think that the psyche works in a way that you can circumnavigate suffering. I don't think, I don't think repression in that way, I think you have to go through those things. And is there a way to almost take that 
you know, that present moment, that mindfulness, that capacity to kind of be in the now as a form of saying, you know, like I'm accepting what's happening to me and being present for this and letting this like be within me, wash over me. Like, yes, I'm feeling enormous loss. Yes, I'm terrified. This is happening to me. And this is a part of the fabric of life and I'm, I'm in it and this is what's happening now. And, you know, being, I wonder, I I don't know if I personally have ever been able to do this in my life, but I wonder if you adopted that attitude and took time out of it. Like I'm going to suffer like this forever, or this reminds me of the last time I suffered. If you took that equation out of that kind of line if you would able to kind of just like be with it, be affected by it, let it wash over you, recognize this is happening, but not, it's like we talked about earlier, almost like stick ourselves in the suffering, which yeah. then I think creates the stagnation that becomes unbearable. Mm. Like, is there but, a way to mm. meld it? But if you see, if you look at it, I mean, from the perspective of, I mean, we are talking about suffering is, requires time the sense of time, because you have to have memories, you have to have thoughts, you have to have ideas. Uh, I mean, you can, yes, it is like that, because otherwise it's, we're talking about pain. Pain is inevitable, like we said. You will always experience pain, but pain is momentaneous. It's instant, mm-hmm. instantaneous. It just, it happens and it's terrible, but then it passes. Mm-hmm. Then you don't, you're not in pain anymore. Mm-hmm. Why should you linger on that pain when it's past, if you see what I mean? I mean, yeah. There's no point in that, really. I mean, philosophically, depending on, of course, what you think about what we are, what is a human being? Are we just biological machines? Then you might think, and we only have this life, then you might think it's important to just, you know, think about that pain that happened because it might happen again. (laughs) But I don't know. I'm just uh, babbling here. You know what it makes? It makes me think of kind of like the, maybe it's a, it's back to kind of an aim of what you're after in life. Like, I think the way it's almost the way that I'm imagining it is like spirit or soul. And it's like the spirit in the now, the present, that kind of transcendental energy that's of the heights, right? That's the, the part of us that maybe we could say would could say, you know, be in the now, like it doesn't matter. You're, you're not this pain. You're not this experience. You're not what you just lost. You know, that kind of pulling out, Soul is a really different quality of being. It's deep, it's heavy, it's about suffering, it's about like the, I think, about time, about digging into what's happened. And it's kind of like peak or veil, right? Do you do you want to transcend this experience and kind of be in an in in one way of relating to our being? Or are you trying to kind of root into it or find some kind of balance in between? or one place in between, because it's almost like I'm imagining in some ways, it's like the laws of the universe are so different. If you're kind of trying to to transcend the human condition, be in that kind of enlightened place in the present beyond that, or you're trying to kind of deepen into it in a way to try to understand it as related to your personhood, the aims are so different. Mm. Yeah, but it, yeah, uh, exactly. Now I just lost my train of thought I, yeah, I don't know but i mean we we need a, a cute french coffee shop where we can just mull over philosophical ideas exactly <laughs> well in the but you, you in the book you, you you don't have very many spiritual references there are a few but i think you mentioned at some point also not believing in god yourself is that correct or i mean d- depending on how you define god of course mm-hmm. i would say depending on how you define god and i yeah. think i'm transparent in the book that i'm not um, like my sense of faith or spirituality or the sacred does not come from the Abrahamic Judeo-Christian tradition. And, you know, I think in a lot of ways, like to kind of circle us back to Jung, like, I think this is one of my big draws to Jung is, you know, every, every psychology will obviously be, um, influenced by the questions of its founder. And, and I think, you know, for Jung, the question of Jungian psychology is spirituality. Mm. It's, you know, Jung grew up, with a, um, a, like his father was a priest, um, a Jesuit priest, and I think kind of had his own really dark relationship with faith. It's a big question for Jung in his entire life. And one of the things he really emphasizes is the kind of spiritual function in the psyche is so important. That connection to something larger than yourself, belief in something larger than yourself, the medicinal energy of that for our kind of 
place in the universe, our capacity to kind of feel guided. I mean, he makes a huge point that that's enormously relevant. And I believe in that 100%. But I think the, 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 the reason why I say, you know, I, I'm really drawn to Jung in that sense is, is Jung says like, you know, we need an active symbol of the sacred. It has to be relevant to your personhood. And so if you come from, you know, if, if you align with the Judeo Christian Godhead and the symbols of that mythology, great. Let that be your way into that energy. And there are a growing group of people, I think, in our culture that don't. Mm. And if you don't, then you're either going to lose that sacred function in the psyche, or you have to get busy finding what are the alive symbols for you. And, you know, I think for, for Jung and for his framework that comes from the self and it comes from your dreams and your experiences of kind of synchronicity or numinosity, but the idea being, you know, what is your, what feels alive? What, what makes you connect to something larger than yourself? What's your image of that, that for you can feel relevant. Mm -hmm. And if you can, then you can tap into that archetypal energy. That is the basis of all religion and feel that connection to something larger than you that orders the world, that explain things, that roots you in something. Um, but it needs to be alive for it to be meaningful for the psyche. Yeah. The, the very idea of, I mean, synchronicities and, and the collective unconscious and archetypes uh, tells me that it, it can't really be physical, can it? It must be non-physical in a, in a way. Or mm -hmm. does, does, I mean, the, the, where does the the unconscious reside does the brain mm -hmm. have anything to do with it as you see it yeah i Something, mean uh, perhaps <laughs> i mean it's like i feel like one of the richest and most like unknowable and questions and answers although our you know steps towards neuroscience are pretty remarkable you know near the end of jung's life he became he became he started this relationship with this metaphysicist wolfgang pauli and i know yeah the jung pauli connection or co yeah. conjun conjecture i think it's called yeah and and i think you know if jung had lived longer than his very long life anyway you know he near the end of his life he got really really interested and his later works are all about kind of this question of where does psyche reside? Yeah, quantum and, physics and everything, yeah. Yeah, and this connection, you know, synchronicity and that a casual connection. And I think, you know, if you've had a powerful synchronicity, it's 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 like, what? You know, I know, it's that, I know, you can't explain. I mean, it really sh sh shakes you. <laughs> It's, it's like, it's incredibly shaking and, 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 and really, really powerful. And I think, you know, that you start asking these questions, these metaphysical questions of kind of what is, you know, cause we come from that Cartesian Newtonian, like, you know, like hard, you know, this exists because I can touch it and feel it. And, and we've changed that ideology, but I think because our senses don't function that way it's really hard to wrap your head around like the fact that this table, like it isn't really a table and doesn't really exist. You know, you're like, okay, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do with that. Um, but Jung gets really into, he calls it the psychoid archetype that he spends a lot of time on in the end of his life. And this idea of kind of this matrix of everything that's connected and, you know, there isn't a separation between you and I in any kind of energetic way, nor our psyches. And where does all this come from? I mean, I have no idea. I mean, I think there's really cool work being done, you know, in the Jungian field on those ideas of kind of like synchronicity and um, the provost and of um, Pacifica is really, oh no, I'm forgetting his name. Okay. What is his name? <laughs> I know. I, oh, I shouldn't Sorry. even brought it up. Joseph something. What is he? A, a scientist or a philosopher? He's a, Jungian, or a... he's a Jungian who he and his whole work is kind of on like a casualty okay. and the connection between these, you know, how we see psyche in different places, like psyche and kind of like murmurs of swallows. You know, why do why do mm. animals move in those ways and have these patterns that they're not they're like instinctively connected? It's like the psyche is one thing. I mean, this this question of where it is, yeah. is it part like is is it an epiphenomenon of the brain or not? Um, I would argue the analytical and the depth perspective would suggest that it's not just an epiphenomenon of the brain. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, it and seems when you, larger. When you look at those uh, uh, 
flocks of birds is that the word yeah or, yeah like the Burn starlings birds. yeah the starlings they are it's it's really incredible and they, they turn thousands of them turn exactly at the same time it's not there's no delay at all it's like yeah. it is one organism truly it is so, and that the, it's like yeah and that's that's back to that kind of our cartesian divide thing like what if we didn't think of the world as completely divided mm. as completely it would change separate. a lot yeah. I think it would, it would change an enormous we would amount. feel better i think we wouldn't suffer as much. Yeah, I think we would. I mean, I can't even imagine it in some way, but we would definitely relate to our, our, each other and our planet differently if we really thought mm. that, you know, like the plant behind you is an extension of your being mm. on some level and you hurt it and you hurt you on some level. I mean, mm. all those ideas, they're so radical, but I think we're moving in that direction. You think so? You're, you're, you're an optimist in that respect? Or in many respects, perhaps? <laughs> I don't know you, but maybe you are. Um, let's see. Do I believe that? You know, I don't know. I want to believe it. So maybe, and, and you know what? I do see changes in it. I think in small ways. I think our culture is becoming really anemic for its need for something deeper, something more embodied, something more spiritual, more sacred, more connected. You know, I read some statistic the other day that was saying. Um, something like 40% of teenagers say that they're so lonely that they like, don't even know how to connect to other people. And it's like, even if that statistic is cut that statistic in half and it's still huge, you know? And I, and I think like there is a, maybe I hope that there's a balance that can come, you know? And I, and I think there is a, a loneliness and a disconnection and, and like I said, an anemia that our culture suffering under and maybe to balance it out, you know, there's, a call for something it's, it's you know it's kind of how I feel about myth you know I feel like when I tell people myths in 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 my practice for example if I say you know this reminds me of that or it's it's like water on a parched soul people are just mm. like what they feel connected to something older deeper more alive you know mm. and when I was teaching uh, about a year ago I was teaching at this college and um about a couple days into it this this gal came up to me and she was like you know I just want to let you know you're, you're just like one of the most empathetic people I've ever seen in my life. And which was a very interesting comment because, you know, between you and me, that's just, it's, that's not who I am. <laughs> um, but I told her, I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if you feel so enormously seen by these ideas that they're touching something in you that feels so true and validating because, you know, I didn't know the girl's last name. Well, I probably did on my like roster sheet, but I didn't know anything about her life. I couldn't have empathy for mm. this. Person. But you were the person who conveyed these myths and these yeah. ideas was, and that was empathetic to her. Yeah, I was seeing something, you know, and that's where the hope for in me comes from. It's like maybe people will see some some of these ideas and feel, you know, a, a soothing on some level and be drawn to them and bring us more connected and more in balance. And is it a good idea? I know you have some issues with, you're a psychologist yourself, but you have some issues with modern psychology, other, other types of psychology, I reckon. Is it a good idea to draw a line between psychology and philosophy and, and I mean, spirituality for that matter? What do you think? Um, I would not draw a line. Um, I mean, what we've think- been talking about today is just as much philosophy as it is psychology and, and, and spirituality, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I think that line has been drawn. I would say, you know, more depth approaches, something that studies the unconscious. You can't draw that line because it's, it is, you know, I think maybe a simple way to answer that is like, you know, it is no mistake that kind of the emergence of psychology came from a transition in the human history where we went from you know, more tribal living, more religiously connected living, living that was closer to the land, closer to community, much more related in those ways, and kind of moved into cities, created a more industrial life, became more individualistic, and then invented psychology and called ourselves sick. It's like that happened at the same time. And I think psychology is the modern response to the loss of the sacred and in 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 an active, alive relationship with that depth of our being and i would say the two are enormously interchangeable 
Joanna, this has been an amazing conversation and we've been talking for a long time and we could yeah. probably talk for hours more, but <laughs> maybe we should start wrapping this thing up here. Do, do you have more books in the pipeline? What What is your next project? I, you know, right now, I'm not sure. My next project is just deciding what I want to, you know, how I want this book to live in the world. And, um, but right now, no, I have no other projects. Um, I think, you know, I had a dream the other night that I was watching this hillside being built, had kind of construction all over it. And my analyst was like, well, the good news is something's being built. And I was like, oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I love that. But no, I don't know. I mean, I think right now this has been a big project for a long time. You know, it was originally my doctoral dissertation, then it was kind of rebirthed as the book, and then it goes through all this process. And so I think just trying to see what it's in the world, no books for the time being, no just where can people find your your book and and your other work if they're interested in knowing more and maybe reaching out? Yeah, um you I mean you can buy my book on um you can buy it on the Amazon website. Um Penguin House is distributing it. The publisher um which is in a branch of Penguin House is called Watkins. Um I would say if you can the best is just like go to your local bookstore and ask them to order it if they don't have it and support that community. Um it's it's international. So you should be able to get it anywhere. Um, my, you can reach me personally at my website, which is ion psychotherapy, I O N. Um, and you can, there's a form on there that you can, okay, I'll, put, I'll it. put the link in the description. Yeah. If you, yeah, if which you send it to me. has other talks that I've done, um, like lectures that are coming up, various things like that. Um, but yeah, as far as kind of published work, this is the, the first major one. Okay, yeah, and it's it's really good. This oh, is how it you. looks again, forged in darkness. Yeah, so, it's cool, and it's got really cool art in the book that I did. So yeah. it's fun. It's fun you did to it see. yourself. I did do it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing! I love that. Okay, Joanna Laprade, thank you so much for joining. Yeah, thank you so much. The shift, and I wish you all the best uh, with your beautiful work and uh, as a therapist and and whatever else you do <laughs> as a pointer for all of us. Yeah, thank you so much. If you like this video and other interviews and talks on Mind the Shift, please like, share, and subscribe. I appreciate all the support. And you can follow Mind the Shift on Facebook and Instagram. And you can follow me, Anders Bolling, on all the main social media and also on medium.com. Thank you.